and welcome to Crossroads Church. It is good to be with you all. We got a few people over here that are excited. Is anyone else excited to be here today? Okay, good. Hey, thank you guys so much for joining us online. It is good to be with you. Uh, my name is Jared. I'm the pastor of innovation here at Crossroads. And I just want you to know, as one of the pastors on staff, we want you all to know that uh, we want to know you. And uh, there's a lot of you and just a few of us. So it really helps us out if, if you guys come and introduce yourself. So if, if uh, I don't know you yet, I just want to welcome you to come and say hi. Check and say hi to me in the lobby. I want to get to know you guys uh, more and more every week. So uh, it is good to be here. Uh, if you are new to Crossroads, we want to make it very easy for you to know uh, about the church or ask any questions. You can text the word new to our text line. Let us know that we are here, uh, that we are here. Let us know that you are here and that uh, uh, we can help you get connected here. Crossroads Church is a multi-generational, multi-ethnic church. We are focused on discipling the next generation, our kids and our grandkids. And when I first began uh, on staff here at Crossroads, I was the youth pastor right here at Thornton. And it was really fun to see uh, these young guys come into the youth group at, uh, in sixth grade. And they're, they're really small in sixth, sixth grade. And then by the time they graduate, they're, they're usually larger than me. And so uh, there's one person in particular who started coming to youth group when I was the youth pastor, and now she's in high school, and she's put her faith in Jesus, and this morning we got to uh, have the privilege of, of baptizing her. She's publicly declaring her faith in Jesus. We can celebrate that together, but uh, yeah. yes, I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to hear Caitlin's story from her herself, so let's go ahead and listen to her story together. When I first heard about Jesus, I was very young. Yeah, I was six or seven, and I started Awana groups. I started to like Awana groups with uh, one of my best friends. In seventh grade, I was persuaded by one of my friends, um, Gabby, who insisted that I, uh, for about a month that I come and check it out, and eventually I did, and a few months later, I just accepted him into my life. To be a Christian, basically, it means that you are accepting that Jesus died for us. He also died because of our sins, and he wants to free us from those sins. My name is Kaylin, and I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. public declaration of faith in Jesus Christ that it is my privilege to baptize you today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, being able to participate in that today was a lot of fun this morning at 8 to see her uh, get baptized and just the excitement that she had on her face that here at Crossroads, we are all about connecting people to Jesus. And uh, we love to hear the stories and to tell the stories, whether that be like in baptism with Caitlin today and hearing her story, or if you haven't checked out the last couple of weeks, we've been doing this new series called uh, on YouTube called Practical Living, where Jared is like moving with people and learning skills and actually being able to tell their stories. And so the last couple weeks have been awesome. And uh, the first week we had uh, Wally, this is on the screen here, telling his story about welding. But then uh, last night we had our very own um, uh, Sam Messerly, who's in the house today. Sam, where are you at today? Sam, somewhere over here, right? He's hiding. I don't know where he's at. He's with my wife. Where's my wife? Oh, there he is, right there in the red. Yeah. So Sam Messerly, he's a race car driver. This is him with his son, Alex. And uh, they uh, had a really great uh, story last night to hear Sam's story, to tell of his faith, but also to learn a skill of riding race cars. And so if you have not watched Practical Living, I would encourage you uh, to do so, that you could watch it, like it, share it. Um, we would love for you uh, to do that as we continue to tell these awesome stories. And here's some cool news. 
is that these have been so popular that we actually want to do 12 more of these stories. And so if you have a skill that you want to share and a story to tell, we would love to hear from you. And so whether you want to get baptized or you want to be a part of Practical Living, the easy way to do that is to simply text NEXT, the word NEXT, uh, to the number on the screen, 720-513-1933, all right? So with that said, I want to welcome everyone here at Thornton as well as online. If you are new with us, my name is Matt Manning. I'm the senior pastor uh, here at Crossroads Church, and today we are in kind of the last season of our uh, series in Luke, that if you've been a part of Crossroads for the last couple of years, uh, then you'll know that we have been methodically walking through uh, this gospel, looking at the story of Jesus through the eyes of Luke. And in this last season, our focus has primarily been on Jesus' last week leading up to his crucifixion, that we're following Jesus as he walks and marches through the last week of his life up into the crucifixion, his death, and ultimately his resurrection. And today, we've made it to the part of the story where Jesus is in the trials leading to that crucifixion. And really, it's this whirlwind of about a 12-hour period that begins with Jesus celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples and then ending with the cross, him hanging on the cross. And in between those two events, Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, is betrayed by one of his boys, one of his disciples, Judas. He's taken to the house of the high priest, Caiaphas, and there he stands trial before the religious leaders called the Sanhedrin. And the charges that they bring to Jesus during his trial, when it comes to the religious part of his trial, is is that he was blaspheming God, that he was declaring himself the Son of God, and he had the audacity to call himself the Messiah. Well, in that trial, they find him, the religious leaders find him guilty of those charges, and then they bring him to a Roman governor named Pontius Pilate. And they bring him to this Roman governor, governor with charges of inciting people to riot, telling people not to pay their taxes, and worst of all, that Jesus was claiming to be king of the people, which carried the weight of death in Rome. Well, after spending a few moments with Jesus, Pontius Pilate determined that Jesus wasn't really guilty of these crimes. He didn't know what to do with them, so he sent him to another Roman official called Herod. Herod determined the same thing, sent him back to to Pontius Pilate, and there in the early mornings of Friday that we call the Good Friday— Pontius Pilate submits to the will of the people as they yell, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And on those early morning hours of Friday morning, Pilate sentences Jesus to death by the cross, the most horrible death possible. This whirlwind of activity over these 12 hours is what leads Jesus ultimately to the cross, And if you've ever read the story in any of the Gospels, you'll know that there is one story that's repeated in all four of the Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a story that's repeated with painstaking detail. It's as if the Gospel writers, all four of them, don't want us to miss this particular story. And it takes one of the story is about taking one of the good guys of the scriptures and painting him in the worst possible lights possible. In fact, if you're here today and you've ever had this thought, the thought of, wow, I didn't know that I could do such a terrible thing. If you've ever had that thought, well, I didn't know that I could do such a terrible thing, then this story is for you. If you know your scriptures, you're probably familiar with where we're going. We're going to the story about Peter's denial of Jesus on the night before he was crucified. We find the story in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 31. Jesus and his disciples, like I said, are eating the Passover meal. Jesus drops the bomb on them that he's going to die. We saw that last week in Pastor Chris's sermon. As the disciples are grappling with all of that, Jesus turns to Peter, and he says these words to him, starting in verse 31. He says this, Simon, Simon, that's just Peter's Hebrew name. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat's. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And Jesus said to him, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. We pick up the story in verse 55 after the betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Peter standing in the courtyard, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this, this man was also with Jesus. But he, being Peter, denied it, saying, woman, <laughs> I don't know him. And a little while later, someone else said to him and said, you are also one of them. But Peter said, man, I'm not. And after an interval of, of about an hour still, another insisted, saying, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, you got to believe me. I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter and remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Before we dive into this, would you just bow with me in a word of prayer, Father? Lord, we know that your presence is here and we come to experience your presence. Lord, we come to experience you. And so today, Lord, we ask that in this story that is familiar to so many of us, that we would not succumb to the familiarity, but, Lord, that we would look upon it with fresh eyes, asking you to transform our minds and our hearts towards you today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. On this final night of Jesus' life before the cross, the disciples we see at the Passover meal go from fighting about who is going to be the greatest in Jesus' kingdom to betraying the one that they call king. And it all goes down just the way that Jesus said it would go down. That after the Passover meal, Jesus takes the boys, the disciples, to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, and while they're there praying and, and sleeping, a mob like thirsty wolves, bloodthirsty wolves coming in for the kill comes marching into the garden. And they're led by one of the boys. They're led by one of the disciples, Judas. And Judas earns his blood money by walking up to Jesus and kissing him on the cheek, signaling this is the one that you're looking for. The mob with the Roman soldiers begins to take Jesus away. And as all of this is happening, the other disciples, they're sitting to the side, fearful, scared, not knowing what to do. And in their fear, they take off running. And we're told that they're running with such fear that one of the disciples in the Gospel of Mark, we're told that one of the disciples is running with such fear that one of the Roman guards reaches out and grabs him by the clothes, and he keeps going. He just keeps running, butt naked, into the darkness of the night. As all of this chaos is unfolding around Jesus, the only two disciples that even dare to follow trail Jesus as he's being led away to face his accusers is John, by all accounts, Jesus' best friend, and Peter, the one they call the rock. Peter starts this evening with such a resolute defiance of Rome's power. Jesus, in that Passover meal, in this intimate moment, speaks to his disciples about what's going to unfold this night, the suffering that's going to come, that he's going to be deserted by the very people that he's eating dinner with on his way to the cross where he'll ultimately die for the world's sins. And as, as Jesus is sharing all of this, Peter stands up for Jesus and everyone else to hear, and he looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, not me, man. You can count on me. I'll go to prison. I'll go to the grave. I'm the rock. I won't fail you. Later that night, as the mob comes for Jesus, Peter gets his moments. And we find him standing single-handedly against the mob, wielding his sword. And not yet 12 hours later, we will see Peter not even be able to stand up to the accusations of a young servant girl for Jesus, the Lord of his life. And for any of us who've read the story, we wonder, don't we? We wonder about this question, what could account? What could account for, for so great a defection from such a dedicated follower? What could account for a man that they called the rock to fall away from the one that he called Lord? And as we search the scriptures for that answer, we don't have to look too far to find it. We actually find it 
in chapter 22, verse 31, when Jesus, in that moment on the Passover meal, looks at Peter and says this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. It's a line that's so scary reminiscent of the permission that Satan asks in the story of Job in the Old Testament. That on this night, Satan has asked for Peter to enter into the octagon. And as the night will unfold, Satan will thunder punch Pete's faith over and over again until he's laying bare for the entire world to see what his heart really, truly reveals. I mean, to see the rock crumble would be an obvious, devastating blow to the movement of Jesus. It's late at night, and the battle in the octagon begins. It's cold and dark and chilly. That Peter has followed Jesus to where his accusers have taken him. He's standing in the cart courtyard, and he walks over to the fire to warm his hands. He outstretches his arms to feel the warmth of the fire. And as he's there, not only is he there to, to get the warmth of the fire, but also to gather his thoughts. That he's following Jesus to this courtyard where they're accusing and trying him because, because Jesus is his Lord and his Savior. And if the tables were turned, Jesus would do the same, wouldn't he? But he's there trying to figure out what to do, confused and torn. And he thinks to himself, should I, should I grab my sword and fight? No, Jesus already rebuked me for that. Do I, do I go into the trial and give witness and testimony to who Jesus is, the miracles that he's, that he's done, the meaning that he has throughout all of Israel? He thinks to himself, that would, that would be worthless. Nobody would believe me. Do I just sit back, maybe, and listen and watch so that in the morning I can go find the rest of the disciples, the followers, and gather them together to figure out what to do next? That Peter's standing there in the, in the cold by the fire, and as he sits there, the talk of the strangers around him is all about the news of the Nazarene's arrests. It's by the light of these flames shooting upward like snakes of fire towards the, towards the sky that hisses that Satan will do his work. Here comes the first blow that a young servant girl sitting across from Peter looks at him and squints and points at him and says, aren't you, aren't you the one? Aren't you the one who, who's walked with Jesus? And Peter says, girl, you don't know who you're talking about. You don't know, that's not me. He scurries away to another fire. He finds his place there, and here comes another thunderous punch as he hears another accusation. Hey, aren't you? Aren't you Peter who's followed Jesus? Again, flatly denying it, this time with more force. Eventually, he makes it to a third fire. And as he's there warming, another accusation, a haymaker from Satan. Another one looks at him and says, hey, you, you are Jesus' follower. I can tell your accent gives you away. You talk like a Galilean. And Peter, in this moment, does everything that he can do to flatly deny the charges, and he musters all that he can. And as he does, somewhere in the distance, a rooster stretches its neck, shakes its feathers, and crows. The rock looks across the courtyard, and his eyes meet with Jesus, his Savior. And Jesus looks upon him, not having to say a word, just looks at him with, with empathy as Peter lays on the mat of that octagon with Satan standing over him. Jesus doesn't have to say a word. He knows what it's like. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, Jesus was in the wilderness, and for 40 days, Satan was there with him. For 40 days, Jesus heard the temptation for 40 days, Jesus faced the trials. For 40 days, Jesus endured the ruthlessness of the sifting that Satan can bring. And now as Peter's locked eyes with his Savior, the look that Jesus is giving back as he peers into his soul is not one of disappointment. It's not even one of judgment or I told you so. It's a look from one friend to another who says, I get it, I understand. And with that look, the emotion explodes in Peter. And he goes running out of the courtyard as far as he can go, fighting back the tears, and eventually falls because of the weight of the shame that he's carrying. And he begins to cry till there's no more tears 
to cry. And he's there crying, having done what he did to Jesus. He's crying for, for who he has become. And he pleads with God, God, would you, would, you just, would you just take back this night? But this isn't some Charles Dickens story where we just turn back the clock, that these dark moments will outlive Peter's life. These dark moments will be laid bare for all of history to see that these dark moments will be laid bare for, for us to see. The tears finally stop, and the darkness of the night gives way to the gray of the morning. The sifting of Peter by Satan is over. He's bruised, humiliated, emotionally naked, spiritually bare. But what's left is a small kernel of faith. Something that Satan could not have, no matter how much he hits. That Satan could not have it because it belonged to Jesus. And there, in that moment, Peter remembers the conversation that he had with Jesus not 12 hours earlier at the Passover meal. When Jesus came to him and said, Pete, Satan's asked for you. And this night, it's going to be hard for you. It's going to be difficult that you're going to face things that you've never had to face in your entire life. But no, trust that I'm praying for you. I'm praying that your faith is going to hold. I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray that your faith stands firm. And that years from now, years from now, when you're past this night, that you will encourage, because of this night, those who you're called to lead. And for those of us who know Pete's story, we know that that wasn't just a prayer that Jesus prayed on the eve of his crucifixion, but a promise that Jesus gave. And when we pause to see this story, like really pause to stop and look at this story, we see that there are two big, huge implications for our life. The first one being this, that Satan has a lot of power in this world. The sifting of, of Peter and others is Satan's effort to destroy their faith. And that remains Satan's goal today. It's relatively unimportant to Satan what the color of your skin is, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're healthy or sick, that Satan is seeking to destroy your faith. He wants to sift you from your faith. And if he can do it by suffering, that's the mode that he'll take. If he can do it by making you wealthy so that you forget about your dependence upon God, so be it. If he can do it through making you so busy that you walk through your entire day without even ever giving a thought to Jesus, he'll take that route too. Years later, Peter, looking back on this experience, is writing to the people that he's called to encourage. And he speaks about the hard-earned lesson that he learned on this night. And he writes these words in 1 Peter chapter 5. He says this, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. How? By being firm in your faith. On the eve of Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus describes Satan as a farmer who's sifting Christians from their faith like wheat. Thirty years later, Peter, having lived through that experience, pictures Satan as a roaring lion ready to devour anyone in faith. And if that scares you, that's a healthy place for you to be. That Satan is a thousand times more evil than you and I can ever imagine. And yet as true as that statement is, know that the only person that Satan can sift is the person who is not connected to Jesus. The only person who fits in the jaws of the lion is the person who does not believe in Jesus, that our faith in Jesus is the victory that overcomes Satan's sieve and Satan's prowl. Come on, listen, this is so important. If we hold fast, Peter says, if we hold fast to our faith, and this isn't just some theological thing, right? This, this is Peter real life. If we're able to hold fast to our faith, then there is nothing that we can do or nothing that Satan can do to take us from God. Nothing that Satan can do to take us from God. He cannot destroy us. The second implication of the story in our life 
is just as important as the first, and it's this. Before we cast judgment on Peter, we have to realize that he went further than most of us would have. That before we go casting judgment on Peter's life, we need to realize that he went further than any of us would have. That Peter left everything to follow Jesus in his life. For three years, Peter stood by Jesus every waking moment. For three years, Peter healed people, cast out demons, did his very best to live out the teachings that his Savior gave to him to live out in his life. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, when everybody else, all the other disciples were running, it was Peter who followed him all the way to the courtyard. It was there when the mob started moving in that Satan wielded his sword sword like Duncan Idaho from Dune, ready to take on anybody that was coming after Jesus. And when all the others deserted, it was Peter that followed. I mean, come on, let's be honest. Most of us, if not all of us, would have never made it that far. And the reason that I can have confidence in saying that is because every day we deny Jesus. That every day and many times and in many ways we deny Jesus. That I deny Jesus when I, when I fail to pray. I mean, just think about this, that, that we struggle to meet with the creator of the universe who just simply wants to hear our voice who just simply wants to hear about the joys and the struggles that we face, to simply, to simply talk to him about what our days are like. I mean, it's like a father wanting, just wanting to hear the voice of his child. And because we live such busy and chaotic lives, I mean, come on, we can't even make time to speak to the creator of the universe. And in that, I deny that Jesus is the center of my life that I deny Jesus when I neglect his word. I mean, most of us don't even realize that throughout history of the world, there has been this endless and continual a pursuit to get you and me the scriptures. That this is a book whose central theme is about Jesus, about God's love, and what it looks like to truly live. It's a book that was written by, by 40 different authors over thousands of years in many, many different genres, three different languages. And shortly after this this book was put together, these letters and poems and songs were written, men would dedicate their entire lives, entire lives, to copying the scriptures word for word so that the next generation could have it. That just three centuries ago, just three centuries ago, you would have had to, uh, to save your entire lifetime's worth of wages just to buy the book. That most people would save a year's worth of wages just so that they could go to the one person in the village who actually had a Bible so that they would be able to read it for a day. Men like Zingli and Luther and Wycliffe would end up giving their lives in order that these words could be put into the common language of the people. That there has been this relentless and continual pursuit throughout history, this miracle of God working miraculously through history in order that you might have one or more Bibles sitting on your shelf. And hear me, it is no small thing that that book can sit on your shelf. And if all it ever does is sit on your shelf, then you deny Jesus. You deny Jesus as being the competent guide for your life. That I deny Jesus when, when worry, when I worry to the point of paralysis. That worry becomes sin when it prevents us from doing the next most responsible thing. I mean, if I truly, really, truly believe that God is sovereign and that all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus and that Jesus' promise is really true that he's walking with me throughout all of my life as a believer, then I have to believe that Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount are totally true. Do you remember when Jesus is giving the teaching and he says, go ahead, take all of your worries and you just stack them all up. Like a bunch of books, just stack all of your worries right here. Now look at them and ask yourself, How many hours has it added to my life? The implied answer is zero. Jesus looks at the people on that day and he says, come on, your Father in heaven knows what you need. He knows what all your worries are. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things that you're worried about, they will be added unto you. When I allow worry to become chronic in my life, 
I deny that Jesus is the Lord of my circumstances. I deny Jesus when I turn my head from the hungry and the homeless. When I fail to see the least of these, I deny that Jesus is a God of mercy who's using me in the world to bring about his love. When I steal something from someone else, whether that be material like money or even something as simple that we think as credit that's due from someone else, that's due to someone else. When I steal in this world, I deny that Jesus is the one who brings all blessings into my life. That as we read this familiar story, if we're moved to judgment in our hearts, if we read this passage and look at Peter in judgment, then we miss the points. And we're no better than the Pharisees that tried Jesus on that faithful night. That this story is given to us like we're peering into a mirror. And as we look at our own denial of Jesus, it should drive us to our knees, should drive us to our knees as we cry out in forgiveness to God. God, forgive me of all the ways, the quiet ways that are known only to you that I denied you on this day. So here's where the rubber meets the road for us. There's no two ways about it that every single one of us in this room and listening online, that we have denied Jesus multiple times in multiple ways in our life. And as your pastor, please believe me when I say this, there is no moral or eternal difference in the way that you have disowned Jesus in the way that Judas and Peter disowned Jesus. And if you ever realize the heart-wrenching impact that that level of betrayal has on God, then you will finally understand how serious it is. And at that point, there's only two ways to respond. The way of Judas and the way of Peter. Judas, after betraying Jesus in the garden, tried to atone for his own sin by giving back the blood money that had been given to him. He tried to, to recant as he realized that he was sending an innocent man to his death. And certainly Judas felt remorse, he felt regret, but he didn't run to God for mercy. In his mind, he didn't actually believe that he needed it. He thought he could fix the problem by himself. And just as Jesus predicted, it did not end well for Judas. That his guilt and his shame was lynched to the very tree that he took his own life with. We look at Peter, and we see that Peter certainly had remorse. He certainly had regrets. But in his life, he didn't try to figure out a way to make up what he had done. That he knew that that path was just hopeless. That his only opportunity, his, his only possibility for redemption rested with Jesus. And in that moment, as he's, as he's crying on the outsides of the courtyard in the darkness of that night, he had no idea, how could he? He had no idea what that would even look like. But a few days later, after Jesus' resurrection, the Savior comes face to face, looking in the eyes of Peter once again. Can you imagine the horror and the shame and the regret of that moment? And as Jesus is peering into Peter's eyes once again, Jesus offers grace and mercy and forgiveness. And Peter experiences it all as he embraces his Savior. The way of Judas results in emptiness, despair, ultimately death. The way of Peter ends with hope, redemption, restoration, and life. And if you're here today and you're choosing the way of Judas, I just want you to know that you're done. There's no other steps for you. If you're choosing the way of Judas, there's there's nothing here that will help you. But if you're choosing the way of Peter, if we're looking to God for grace and for mercy, realizing all the ways that you've denied Christ, not just on one night that will live for history, but all of your life. If you're choosing the way 
of Peter, then I would encourage you to take the step today of simply texting the word Jesus to the number 720-513-1933. And on the other end of that line is a person who genuinely wants to hear your story and is genuinely interested in helping you take steps towards life. Will you pray with me, Father? Lord, we are grateful for your presence in our lives. And Lord, as we walk through this story, Lord, experiencing the realness of it, I doubt that there's a single person in this room who wants to choose the way of Judas, who willingly walks the path that Judas walked. And yet at the same time, Lord, we are all well aware of our propensity to deny you. Lord, in things that are small and in things that are great. Lord, that as we walk through this life, Lord, we become so easily distracted with fame and wealth, the pursuit of the so-called American dream. Lord, we pile in our lives so much activity that we're just simply left busy with no room for you. And God, maybe if we were completely honest, that's the way that we'd actually want it, to be kings of our own kingdoms, to be queens of our own uh, kingdoms, to do whatever it is that we want to do. And yet, Lord, every single one of us has experienced the way of that life, the despair that it leads to, the regret, the shame, the guilt, the heaviness that we carry that leads to the worry of our lives. And so, Father, today I pray that you would help us take the path of Peter. Lord, that we would own up to our sin, that the shame and the guilt would lead us not to taking things into our own hands, but would lead us to the foot of your cross where you give life. Jesus, what you accomplished on the cross is our hope. It is our redemption. It will one day be our resurrection. And for that, Lord, that's where we put our trust. So, Lord, I pray for those in this room who, Lord, have walked a long time as believers. That, Lord, I know that you're praying a prayer on them just like you did with Peter, that they would remain strong as they are sifted. And, Father, I pray for those who maybe do not yet know you and they can feel the breath of the lion ready to devour them. I pray that they would call out to you, that you would swoop in, and Lord, that you would save. God, you are so good to us. We are so undeserving of the love that you show us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we come today to celebrate communion together, we remember the trial of Jesus, an innocent man who died on the cross for the guilty in this room. That on that cross, Jesus took his body and it was broken just like the bread of Passover. His blood was spilt so that our sins would be forgiven and that we would only know life. And so today, we celebrate together that good truth. Would you join with me as we eat the bread together? And remember, the blood that was spilt is the blood of our salvation, our redemption, our hope. With such an amazing God, what can we do but stand and sing our praises and our thanksgiving to him? And so that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna invite every single person in the room to stand online, whatever posture of worship you wanna take. If you need prayer, we'll pray for you. We consider it an honor to do so. Online, click the button, in-house, make your way over to the prayer bulletin. But we're gonna sing together. said we want to take this time to meet with the king through singing i just think it's such a beautiful thing that when we sing to him there's something that purifies our hearts it brings us together brings us joy it brings us refreshment if we allow it so let's take this time to meet with jesus together
your mercy never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God
shaking sand You stomp your feet and clap your hands I feel it around the rock When I feel my hope about to break I will speak to your unchanging grace Let the waters come and the earth give way I'll be dancing in the rain in our lives that it can be, uh, we're going through some really hard things that are just sad or, or upsetting, but isn't it good to get together and just celebrate a little bit together? Yes? Anybody? Okay. Maybe it's just me. I love being able to gather and just celebrate the goodness of God. So I'm also a little frustrated that James always gets to be the tallest, and so I brought myself out a stool because I think it's about time that James knows what it's like to be the shortest person in the room. We are like Sesame Street characters together. <laughs> we want to get connected here at Crossroads Church, don't we? Yes, we do, and James is going to tell you how to do that. All right, guys. Hey, we would love to help you get connected here. We made it real easy. You can do it from your cell phone with a text uh, today or anytime during the week. And we have three key words that you can text to let us know. The first is new. If you're new to Crossroads and you just want to let us know you're here, just a reach out. If you're ready to take a next step of connecting in a meaningful way, you can text the word next. And here's the cool thing. A next is really a gateway word. So it allows us to connect with you and really help you with the next step, whether it's truly connecting in a community group, uh, meeting a tangible need, maybe it's a care request, uh, uh, but uh, for us to be able to serve you where you're at in a meaningful way. And the final one is Jesus. And uh, maybe you heard something today about this, this, this character Jesus, and you're curious to know a little bit more about who he is and why he's such a big deal to us, you can text the keyword Jesus and uh, someone will reach out to you personally and follow up. Absolutely. You're doing really good, James. I'm really disappointed for all these people over here that can't see you because I'm so tall. So, uh, no, but we, we're real excited about this mission. Uh, <laughs> I'm excited about this mission of just sharing Jesus with the world, and I know that you guys are too. And if you would like to partner with us uh, through your financial giving, we want to make that easy for you as well. Go to CrossroadsABC.com. You can give that way. You can give through the app. Or if you're in the house today, we do have buckets in the back that uh, you can put uh, your money in uh, there as well. So thank you so much for, for joining with us and for your gracious generosity that you give uh, to share Jesus with the world. All right. Hey, friends, we want you to have a fantastic day and a fantastic week. week. So we'd like to uh, pray a blessing over you. And uh, this is actually almost marching orders for us, too, as we go on mission for what God's called us to. So if you'll raise your hands together. This is from 2 Corinthians 13. He says, finally, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. So friends, let's take those words. Let's be peacemakers as we go out, wherever your feet take you this week, for God's glory and for our good. And uh, yeah, let's get after it. Cheers. Have a great week.